thanks for showing up, you know, for a, what, what was really an impromptu meeting. We only announced this like a week ago, which so it's incredible we get this many people. So lucky us. There must be like, what, 45, 50 people there? So the reason we did this was, you know, the, the, the programs of the, the last, our regular programs, the last Tuesday of each month, I kind of wanted those, and George did too, reserved for local programs. Uh, history that's strictly local. I don't want to go too far away from where we are. But things pop up that don't fall into that category, and we thought, well, we could do a couple, three programs a year of these, these programs of more general interest that, that don't involve Monroe County or our area. And so today's falls right into that category. Um, here's a few, few words from George, my Minister of Propaganda. <laughs> He's being nice now. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, in particular, I want you all to give Julie uh, a sign of appreciation for and Carrie and the other ladies that have stepped up to, to help us through this today. Uh, how many of you got this notice by email? Did you notice it was late? <laughs> well, there's a little bit of communications gap between Mike and I, who talk to each other about three days a week. Ron, so, potato skins. Ron, uh, potato skins. Who is Ron, skin? potato skins? Right here, man. Oh, right here. Over here, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, a couple of weeks ago, when we were putting this together, I asked Dr. Clay Stuckey, uh, if he'd be interested in giving this presentation to a, a group of our high school classmates. And somewhere along the line, Mike decided that it should be to offer to the entire group. So we won't make this mistake again. Mike and I are talking again. He says, <laughs> he says we won't make the mistake. Matthew? Yeah, that's right, Mike. If I do it wrong, you get blamed for it. Uh, at any rate, looking forward to this presentation today uh, about Civil War Field Artillery. I'd like to thank Katz once again for coming uh, to, to, to do this viewing. Uh, it's going to be particularly neat because we're getting these presentations on YouTube. And if you ever see on YouTube where it says subscribe, do that. Because if you do that, it doesn't send us any money, but what it does do, it makes you aware of whenever we put a new presentation on there, without having to look through the list of the video index. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I see a lot of people are doing that now. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank the Legion for their participation in this project. And do any of you have any comments, questions, criticism for the good of the cause? Beg pardon? Hi, Julie. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I'm so sorry. All right, so I'm going to hand the uh, microphone back to Mike and there's Mike. Mike to Mike. Uh, I'm gonna, yeah, thanks to Katz for such, you know, uh, they didn't get much heads up on this. So it's really great that they can show up. Uh, just a few comments on the, the programs coming up. On July 31st, it'll be our regularly scheduled program. Brad Cook of IU Archives uh, will return to give part three of his pictorial history of IU start, starting around 1930. This, this is to be about the fifth time Brad's been on. So he's a, frequent flyer here. Uh, August 28th, local historian David Nord will give a presentation on the history of Spring Mill State Park in words and pictures. Not Monroe County, but pretty close, close enough. Uh, September 25th, 2018, Michael White of Cats TV, uh, the people that record this, is going to give a history of, of, uh, of their uh, programs, which goes back over 40 years. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. October 30th, Carrie Beam, director of the Wiley House, will give a detailed program on the Wiley House and what an important place it occupies in our local history. November 27th, Monroe County History Center uh, director Susan Dyer will give a program focusing on the role uh, the women at RCA played in war production in World War II. Uh, December 18th, local author and historian, uh, historian Derek Ritchie, another guy who's done about five programs, We'll return to show more old photos from the 1960s scanned, uh, that we scanned from the archives of the Bloomington Herald Telephone and Herald Times. January 29th, 2019, IU history professor emeritus James Madison will give a program tentatively on the bicentennial of Monroe County. And then finally, 
uh, February 26, 2019, John Summerlock of IU will give a presentation about uh, Captain William Anderson, Alexander, and the Alexander Memorial, at, uh, which is on the south side of the courthouse lawn. Uh, and I left one out. If, oh, yeah, in March, and I forget the presenter, a guy will give a, uh, uh, he's an expert on Ernie Pyle, so he's going to give a detailed story about the, the life of Ernie Pyle. Uh, cod sandwich. Okay, so today we got uh, we got Clay Stuckey, uh, an old high school classmate of mine, and a, uh, a real historian, Dr. Clay Stuckey. Uh, he's going to give a program on Civil War field artillery, the rest of the story. And uh, Clay will fill, fill in the interesting background about Civil War artillery that uh, most people uh, don't know about. So, uh, and I saw Clay give this, and so did one other guy. He gave this for the Civil War Roundtable, so I know it's good. So, uh, Clay? <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike, and thank you all for uh, coming here today. Can you can you all hear me? Does this, Mike? Did you this? Did you do something to it when you? Can you? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, folks, for all coming here today. We read. Civil War histories of battles in which the authors tell us the artillery did this or the artillery did that. And we walk the battlefields and we experience the actual cannon themselves standing lonely and quiet vigil over those hallowed grounds. What I want to do today is tell you what you cannot learn from reading those general histories. You have to read the technical literature, and you certainly can't learn these things from looking at the cannons themselves on the battlefields, because they have been stripped down of all their accoutrements in order to make them vandal-proof. Our first slide tells us two things. First, that I'm going to be talking about Civil War field artillery. I'm not going to be talking about the large cannon, the Dahlgrens or the Columbians that were in Civil War forts, either earthen or masonry, or were on warships or river gunboats. I'm not going to be talking about the middle level size of siege artillery that was occasionally lugged around by armies that were going to siege a particular fort or a city. I'm not going to be talking about mortars. I'm going to be talking about three types of cannon that uh, were 95, 90 to 95% of all Civil War armies, federal or Confederate, Eastern or Western theater, and the other 5 or 10% types, if they never existed, wouldn't have made a dime's worth of difference. So that is what the subject will be today three kinds of artillery weapons that were the backbone of Civil War Army's <coughs> artillery. The second thing this slide tells us is that this is an artilleryman who is standing next to his cannon. He is not a cavalryman or an infantryman that has wandered uninvited into our program. He is an artilleryman, and we know that because of the red piping on his uniform. If he were a cavalryman, that would be yellow piping. And if he were an infantryman, that would be light blue. And if he would only be so cooperative as to bow his head, where we could see the top of his kepi, he had the universal symbol then and now, the badge of the artilleryman, the crossed cannon. And that slide points us out that 6% of all Civil War soldiers were artillerymen. Now, let's establish some ground rules. When you read general histories of the Civil War, 
you will read that a typical federal battery had six guns and a typical Confederate battery had four guns, and that's generally true. And the battery was the fundamental organizational component or uh, level of artillery. You will read that in the Civil War, federal artillery was generally better than Confederate artillery, and Confederate cavalry was generally better than Union cavalry, and that's generally true. Certainly, federal artillery was better throughout the war, with the uh, at least one exception that comes to mind is the Battle of Chancellorsville, when the uh, Confederate artillery rose above its normal mediocrity and outshined the federal artillery. But that cavalry business, let's take a second look. It depends on where and what time. Certainly at the beginning of the war, federal cavalry was woefully uh, 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 inconsequential compared to uh, Confederate cavalry. But in the Western theater, the Union cavalry, cavalry slowly got better and better. And then in the Eastern theater, it took them a little longer. But by the end of the war, federal cavalry was every bit as good as Confederate cavalry. So, given in mind that that generalization took a closer look, let's look at number one again and realize that in the Atlanta campaign, Sherman's forces had 29 four-gun batteries, 22 six-gun batteries, and were one very anomalous five-gun battery. Or that in May 1864, the largest army in, uh, on the federal side, the Army of the Potomac reduced batteries from six guns to four. So all of a sudden, that first generalization is looking a little shaky, although basically, if you look at all artillery, it's still true. But getting into the spirit of that, I just want to hope that what I say today is mostly true. Now, you can, when you go to Civil War battlefields throughout the country, large and small, you almost invariably are seeing artillery pieces that are genuine Civil War cannons. Only in some recently created parks of the smaller variety do will they have reproductions. But by and large, when you see artillery, you're looking at the real McCoy. What you are not seeing are real carriages, because the real carriages were wood and they would have rotted out years ago. What you are seeing are aluminum cast carriages that have been painted to look like wooden carriages. Now. We're going to start off with talking about artillery vehicles. And there were five different kinds of artillery vehicles. They all had interchangeable wheels that were 57 inches in diameter with 14 spokes. They were all two-wheeled. Because a two-wheel vehicle, if you think about it, is much more stable on very rough ground where often artillery was required to go. And even if they wanted to create a four-wheeled vehicle, they would attach one two-wheel vehicle to the other with a point contact. And that was far more stable on rough ground than a four-wheel wagon would be. Now we're going to start off with the, with the carriage, the basic vehicle and artillery, the thing that carried the cannon. Now the carriage is a wonderful engineering construction that was the culmination of 150 years of evolution in which every nut, bolt, piece of iron on there had a specific purpose. To start off with, if you look at that blue line, that is parallel to the earth and the axle tree, which is the part between the wheels and is flat across. The axles of each individual wheel, the part that's perpendicular to the, to the wheel itself, which is indicated by the red line over there, you notice that the wheels are actually canted at an angle, each one to the central axle tree. Does everybody see that? Also notice that the wheels are dished, concave looking out. And there you, you can see it. If you look at the, the wheels, you can tell that they're dished. But you also can see that they're canted. Now, does everybody, when I say that, does everybody see canted wheels? OK, because that's very important. Civilian carriages were often built this way as well. Not always, but often. Well, the metal carriage axle, called the axle tree, in the center there, you can see that the axles 
that accommodated the wheels themselves were built this way to provide the cant so that when those wheels are attached to the axles, whoop, they're canted. Well, why? What's, what's the big deal about this? It gives elasticity to the carriage and acts as a shock absorber. Now, that seems incredible to us, but in the days before springs in carriages and all, and even in an artillery piece, your artillery mount is going to last longer if those axles are canted to provide a shock absorber uh, to uh, give longevity to the piece. It makes the carriage wider with decreased length of the axle tree. It allows tighter turns. And tighter turns brings up another feature. When you look at the side on what was called the, uh, uh, well, I forget what it's called right now, uh, the uh, wheel guard plate is a little square piece of iron attached to the wooden trail. That's the word I was looking for, the trail. That is there, so when in a very sharp turn, as we'll learn in a little while, the limber, when it is attached at a pivot point, to the carriage, if it were in a very sharp turn, the iron wheel on the limber would gouge out the wood on the trail. So that little piece of iron was there to protect the wooden trail Jim? in a sharp Jim? turn. Jim? And that's the wheel guard plate as indicated there. And the trail or stock is that wooden piece that comes down uh, the back end of the mount. An additional reason to have the wheels canted and dished is it threw mud away from the artillery piece itself, which is very important in civilian carriages, because civilians in particular don't like to have mud from the wheels thrown on them. And then an interesting uh, sidelight here is if you're going to have canted axles and dished wheels, that means that the iron tire put on the, the uh, outside of your wheel, that iron tire cannot be perpendicular to the spoke. It has to be at a particular angle to the spoke in order that the iron tire be absolutely flat with the ground. When the spoke behind it is canted off at an angle. I tell you, it's an engineering marvel putting these together. <laughs> Now, on the, the, the trail, you'll see two hooks. They're called prolong hooks. And they were there in order to have a rope called a prolong that was wrapped, that was, they were stored on the uh, trail. The prolong was used when you were in extremis and you wanted to back the cannon away from the enemy but still be firing at the enemy as you were doing so. So... Firing by prolong, you either had the horses or just men pulling on the rope one direction while you are still firing the cannon with the, the other direction. And another thing for that slide to point out is in a six-horse <clears throat> six uh, uh, limber pulling these things, men rode the left horses, which uh, uh, were called the near horses, and the right horses, which were called the uh, off horses, were not ridden. So there'll be a saddle on those left horses, no saddle on the right horses. And it is something that Hollywood and artists love to show dramatic pictures of artillerymen riding on the limbers or the caissons, holding on to those uh, iron hooks. We'll look at that later. Artillerymen did not ride on caissons or limbers. They walked. Uh, they were per, per, uh, forbidden to ride on caissons or limbers because it put too much strain on the horses. Only when they were in extremis would you ever see an artilleryman riding on a caisson or a limber. Now these two pointing rings on the end, in order to train our cannon and aim it properly, it was convenient to use those two pointing rings in which to insert a hand spike to give you a little more leverage to move the cannon to the right and to the left. 
and that hand spike was carried uh, in a, a, a holder on the side of the, uh, what, what's the cheek of the cannon. The two handles, one on each side, the trail handles, those were there for them to lift up the trail of the, of the uh, carriage and put it on the limber that then pulled the whole uh, cannon carriage along. And these things were so well balanced that about when I was a younger man by 12 or 15 years, when somebody wasn't looking in a museum, I actually lifted a cannon by its trail handle. I could just barely do it, uh, but I could lift it. Two men could do it easily. Two young men, <laughs> healthy. I could do it. <laughs> and the lunette is, a, uh, is what would go over the uh, receptacle on the limber uh, to pull the, the carriage. And the elevating screw there, you see that twisting thing, that was what would be to adjust the cannon up and down. And we saw how the hand spike would adjust uh, the aiming right and left. Okay, what you will see on, on carriages in the battlefields are a chain. The chain is there as a brake. If you stop and think, if you have horses pulling a heavy cannon down a steep incline, the uh, weight of the cannon is in uh, it's gathering momentum. It could hurt the horses by pushing them against the back of the horses. So when they were going to go down a steep incline, they'd throw the chain through the spokes, and, and the, the horses then would drag the cannon down without the wheels turning. But it would be easy to do because we're talking about a steep slope. And all the... Uh, the instruments for dealing with the bore of the cannon, a sponge and rammer, the gun worm, uh, were all in receptacles of the side. You see at the top of the slide there, those circles, those iron rings, the uh, sponge and rammer and the gun worm would slide through those. And here on the lower left, there would be a metal strap that was adjustable that would cinch them down so they wouldn't fall off. So they were all carried. And you can see why you won't see those on a battlefield. Uh, because the vandals would steal that stuff. Occasionally you will see a nice, fully equipped artillery piece in a museum. The water bucket is very important because you really can't operate artillery without a source of water because the gun had to be sponged out between every shot and they would only forego that in they, when they were in extremis and the enemy, enemy is uh, just about on them. Now, what will appear on all these carriages is a Linstock socket, which by the Civil War was an obsolete uh, contrivance, but uh, the Army, being a very conservative outfit, keeps things even after they're no longer necessary. The Linstock was a pole that was pointed on one end and forked on the other and had a slow-burning fuse wrapped around it. When you read about in the early days of musketry in the, uh, in the uh, 18th century and earlier, when uh, uh, shoulder pieces were fired by a uh, linstock, they would have stuck in the ground this pole with this slow burning fuse and use that to touch off their shoulder piece. Well, artillerymen were the same way. That linstock would sit down in the linstock socket, they'd pull it off, stick it in the ground, light that fuse, and that fuse would burn generally throughout the engagement of that particular battle. But that had been uh, replaced by another way of firing the cannon that we'll get into later, so it was no longer used. However, I believe that the Linstocks were still issued to artillerymen. You always need a backup system. Now, the second vehicle we'll talk about is the limber. The limber was the uh, thing that the horses pulled that was attached to the carriage that then pulled the cannon. So the limber had an ammunition chest on it and uh, was attached to the cannon carriage at a single point. We will discuss types of cannon, but Napoleon was one of them. And a Napoleon uh, limber, uh, uh, fully loaded, weighed about 3,800 pounds, the limber and the cannon and the carriage. And in the Civil War, it was considered that an artillery horse should be able to pull 700 pounds. Alan? 
So if you stop and think, if the artillery limber and carriage weighed 3,800 pounds and you had a six-horse team, then the 4,200 pounds that they could carry if it was a six-horse team allowed a little leeway. In the Confederate Army, most teams were four-horse teams. They simply didn't have the number of horses to provide six-horse teams. They would like to have, but they didn't. So now we're talking about 2,800 pounds worth of force, those four horses, pulling 3,800 pounds worth of stuff. Remember I said that the Federal artillery was generally better than the Confederate throughout the war? There are lots of reasons for that. And of course our ammunition chests, depending upon the type of cannon we're dealing with, can hold either 32 rounds or 50 rounds. And there's a limber that had a grease pot, because there's a lot of metal that needs greased, especially the axles on all these vehicles. And there we see a limber, a real limber, attached to its artillery piece. Now, we don't need to go into detail where the eight-man crew of, uh, fired for firing the cannon, what they had to do, forget about that. Look at the circle part there. The six horses would be attached onto the limber pole and would be pointing to the cannon so that when the ammunition chest was opened, the top of the chest opened forward, then you had six horses, then you had the cannon being fired. That was so those six horses could provide a firewall to protect the limber from incoming enemy shot. You would rather have some dead horses than having the enemy bring a round in that hits the limber chest and blows up the ammunition in it. Horses were expendable. Now, in certain engagements, when you felt secure about your position, artillery horses could be detached from the limber and taken over and hid somewhere in the, in the forest or over the hill or somewhere. But uh, by and large, the horses remained attached to the limbers because it would be necessary after the ammunition is depleted to remove that limber and bring up a caisson or a replacement limber. Or if you looked like you were going to get in, ex in extremis and have to move rapidly, you wanted the horses there to be able to move the cannon quickly. Now, caisson. For all you old army guys that sing the song, these are the things that go rolling along. <laughs> and each caisson had a spare wheel mounted in the cool continental fashion, and they had a spare pole for the horses, and they carried two ammunition carriages, uh, cases. Every gun had a limber that pulled it. Every gun had a caisson that was pulled by a limber and six horses separate from the artillery piece. And here we have the limber attached to the caisson with the spare axle, spare wheel, spare limber, full, uh, spare limber pole, and a real example of that Now, so far, we're dealing with one gun, remember. Now, very, very rarely are you going to see a caisson and a limber attached to you. This picture here is taken at Gettysburg. Occasionally, you will see inside a museum uh, a limber and a caisson, but, but not very often will you see limbers and caissons on the battlefield today. So let's review. So far, our single cannon consists of its carriage pulled by a limber and a caisson also pulled by a limber. That totals 12 horses. A typical six-gun battery thus would have at least 72 horses to get those six guns to the battlefield. And we're not done with horses. The Army of the Potomac in the winter of 1861-62 used 400 tons of hay a day. Artillery horses averaged 1,000 pounds each and had a daily ration of 14 pounds of hay, 12 pounds of oats, corn, or barley, and the life expectancy of an artillery horse was seven and a half months. When it came to picking out horses, 
Cavalry got first choice, artillery got second choice, and everybody else got third choice. But now we're going to talk about two more vehicles that were associated with every battery. One is a battery wagon, which supplies, carried supplies, forage, and was pulled by a limber with its ammunition chest. There was one of these for every six-gun battery. And there you, we see uh, a, a real one. Now the traveling forge, which was necessary to keep the iron fittings re repaired and the horses shod, and the Confederate Ordnance Manual, for example, call for the horses to be shod every five weeks. It too was pulled by a limber with its ammunition chest, although that ammunition chest was generally filled with tools and not with ammunition. Now, there's a, an example of a photograph of a real forge wagon. Remember that part about the, the dished wheels throwing the mud away from the, the, from the vehicle? It didn't always work. <laughs> so remember, every battery had a forge wagon and a supply wagon. Every battery, every six guns had one of those, which meant at the Battle of Gettysburg, for the federal artillery alone, there were at least 62 traveling forges. So, another summary. For every six-gun battery of field artillery, there was at least a total of 28 vehicles. Six carriages with their respective cannon, 14 limbers, each pulling a cannon, or a caisson, or a wagon, or a forge. And there were six caissons, and the one battery wagon and one traveling forge. So there was a total of 28 vehicles to get those six guns to the battlefield. And that does not include spare caissons, which were in, usually included with every battery. So thinking of those six guns in a federal battery along the top, the battery wagon and the traveling forge add 12 more horses to our earliest, earlier 72 to make 84 horses. A normal complement in the Civil War called for a 1 12th addition of horses for spares. This amounted to seven more for a total of 91. Given the artillerists who rode horses, the total for a six-gun battery was anywhere from 98 to 110, depending upon the source you read. And that would not change for any one of the three types of artillery cannon that we're going to discuss. And in addition to the horses, each gun battery totaled at least 120 officers and men, and often as many as 140. So think now, when you see six artillery pieces on a battlefield, just six, and think that represents 120 men and 110 horses. Now, we're going to talk about the artillery, the cannon, things that go boom. There were two types of artillery pieces, generically. One was a smoothbore, and one was a rifle. The smoothbore was the model 1857 Napoleon, 12-pounder Napoleon. They call that because it was invented in France in the regime of Napoleon III. And the rifle, there were two rifle pieces, they were the 10-pounder Parrot and the 3-inch Ordnance Rifle. And those are the ones that made up 90 to 95 percent of all Civil War field artillery. And in a typical Civil War uh, Federal Army, the ratio of three rifle cannon of one kind or another to two smoothbores. And a typical Confederate Army, the ratio was 50-50 of rifle cannon to smoothbores. Now there's a thing called windage. Windage is the space between the projectile and the walls of the cannon that allowed you to be able to easily push 
the projectile and its powder bag down the barrel. This problem was solved for muskets by the creation of the mini ball, where rifled muskets had been with us for 100 years. But in order to get the, the lead bullet down the barrel, they had to beat on it with a hammer because when in fire, it had to be able to fit so well that it, the lead took the grooves of the rifled musket. Well, when Claude Manet invented the mini ball, it had a conical stern end, butt end, went in first, and it easily went down the barrel. And when it was shot, that conical rear end expanded to take the grooves. And that was a, a, a wonderful improvement in the Civil War cannon business, the windage not only allowed you to load the cannon easily, but when the projectile was fired, if it had a fuse in it, the fuse was triggered by the flame of the explosion of the cannon fired. And that had to get around along the sides of the projectile to light the fuse on the end of the projectile. Are you with me? So windage is very important for two reasons. And there was a tenth of an inch of windage uh, in every gun, difference diameter between the projectile and the bore. Now the Model 1857 Napoleon was a smooth bore. It was a bronze cast, bronze piece. Uh, the, the Confederates, they made their own Napoleons. Confederates generally did not have access to the ingredients to produce bronze, but they, uh, so they cast them in iron. And one difference you will be able to tell in the battlefield that federal bronze pieces, in addition to being bronze, had a muzzle flare where the Confederate Napoleons were iron and did not have a muzzle flare. And by the way, for reasons that pass all understanding, in the Civil War, bronze was called brass. When they talk about a brass piece, they're talking about a bronze piece. There is a Confederate Napoleon. And there's a Union Napoleon with its limber. And if you want to see one of these, go down to Bedford and on the courthouse, there are two brass, bronze Napoleons, one was made in 1862 and the other in 1864, and both were made by the Revere Copper Company of Boston, Massachusetts. That same company that gave you ladies Revere wear in the modern age. Now those two are interesting because the diameter of a Napoleon should be 4.62 inches, but the diameter of those two cannon are 5.25 inches, which means your windage is 0.63, it's more than a half an inch, when it should be a tenth of an inch. Well, what's going on? I corresponded with uh, leading experts in artillery <clears throat> in the United States, on Civil War artillery, and posed this conundrum to them, and they did not have an answer, but they suggested one. First of all, this would be, we know it's a, a federal, started out as a federal artillery uh, piece, but it obviously was served in the Confederate forces, it was captured because the Federals would never have tolerated a, a piece with that kind of uh, too large of a bore. That would have created a very inaccurate firing and all. That piece would have been sent back to the fire to the factory early on to be remelted to produce a new Napoleon. So that piece got captured by the Confederacy. And then it probably shot a lot of canister, and we'll discuss canister later. But canister was very hard on any kind of bore in which it was fired, and bronze being softer than, than iron. It was really devastating on a bronze piece to fire canister. So their guess was, you can just conclude by the, the increased diameter there, that that was a federal piece captured by the Confederacy and used extensively firing canister. 
Now, those pieces that are sitting there on bronze supports, they started out on carriages when we got them about 1906. And there's the old picture. I'll throw in a picture of limestone just as a throw in. Uh, but you see the carriages there. And here's an old hand-tinted postcard there. We had our wooden carriage, but it rotted away, so the pieces are now sitting on a, on a bronze mount. Now, in olden days, before the Civil War, that's what a cannon looked like. And they had, for want of a better term, this gingerbread on them. Well, the handles, obviously, at the top could serve a function, but the rest of those things were on there. If you'd ask an artilleryman why those were there, he would have probably said, I don't know, they've always been there. Or, well, it wouldn't look right without them. Who knows? But they provided no function. And by the 1850s, it had dawned on metallurgists that anything that deviated from the smooth metal casting created a weak point in the gun. And if it would burst, it would burst around one of these additions. So they did away with those. And you won't see those on any artillery pieces that were made during the Civil War. But I'm going to digress for a moment. I told you we talk about three types of cannon. Well, we're going to throw in a fourth. The Model 1857 Smoothbore Napoleon replaced the Model 1841 Six Pounder. That was the gun that won the Mexican War. It was the standard American Army artillery piece, fired a six pound ball. And you can see there was a little bit of the gingerbread in the design of it. Well, the Federals eliminated early on any of these six pounders in their armies. But the Confederates didn't have that luxury. After the Battle of Antietam, which was in the fall of 1862, uh, Robert E. Lee is writing to uh, uh, President Davis saying, you have got to get these six pounders replaced uh, by uh, the Napoleons because it is hurting our forces dramatically having to utilize these six pounders. And by Gettysburg, which was July of 1863, the, the army in the, in the uh, northern Virginia had replaced most of their six-pounders. Not so in the Western Theater. In the Western Theater, the, the Confederate Army is still using six-pounders uh, at the end of the war. And there we see some captured six-pounders. Now we get into the two rifle pieces. And at the beginning of the war, just before the beginning of the war, Robert Parker Parrott developed a, a cast iron artillery piece that he used a wrought iron reinforcing segment to put on the breech end to provide strength. It had a three inch rifled bore, cast iron, and a wrought iron reinforce. And when these things did burst, and they did occasionally, they always burst uh, where the wrought iron ended and the cast started. Now, uh, the rifle pieces we're going to discuss are all cast iron or wrought iron because you could not use rifling in a bronze barrel because the bronze is too soft. You would wear the, rif the rifling out quickly. The little lands and grooves, you'd wear those out. So there we have a 10-pound parrot uh, ready to go. Now, some of these slides were obviously taken at Gettysburg. You see on the lower left there the corner of a concrete pad, square pad in the ground. Does everybody see that? Just about every artillery piece at Gettysburg has one of those right by the trail. And other battlefields have those too. Those are where a stack of cannonballs used to be years ago. But as vandals were carting them off, the park officials decided enough. Cannonballs go into storage, and we'll just leave that pad there. And there's a 10-pound, 10 10-pounder 10 parrot. The three-inch ordnance rifle was made out of wrought iron, not cast, wrought. They would take long strips of wrought iron, wrap it around a mandrel, 
as you see in the lower left, that's part of the patent application, and then have giant rollers that would roll that red hot bunch of long strips around the mandrel, welding it to itself, and then they would rebore out where the mandrel had been, and the end result was a very smooth designed three inch ordnance rifle. This is pure speculation, but the idea of barrel staves that were vertical pieces with those bands around them, that being a barrel may, may be the origin of the term barrel for the long part of a musket that went back hundreds of years. That's just a guess. And there's a three inch ordnance rifle. And one ready to go on the field. And if you want to visit one of those, just go right up on the courthouse lawn here in Bloomington, where there are two three-inch ordnance rifles. Uh, they were made by the Phoenix Iron Company of Phoenixville, Pennsylvania in 1864. And there are two of them on the square. Now, I know you're all pretty impressed with old Clay and all this knowledge he has about courthouse cannon. So it's with a certain reluctant embarrassment that I confess that all that information is always on the cannon itself. <laughs> it may not always be on the muzzle end. Sometimes it's on other places. And in the case of your cannon here on the courthouse, it's on the muzzle and on the trunnion there. But all that information is always on the cannon even down to the initials of the guy who inspected it. And of course, on the top, you're going to find who made it in terms of the, the U.S. or the Confederacy. <laughs> Only one three-inch ordnance rifle was known to burst in the history of the war, and that had a double load of canister in it, where 10-pound parrots would occasionally burst. Well, you would think that the rifle piece that, that was, had a longer range, it was more accurate and all, you'd think that would be the superior weapon. But General Henry Hunt, the chief of artillery of the Army of the Potomac, was one of the finest artillerists in the Civil War, is quoted as having said that the feeblest, the three-inch ordnance rifle, was the feeblest in the world, the range being needlessly great and the shell too small for practical value. And that would also apply to the 10-pound parrot. Well, I think that is an overstatement. It's not for nothing that the Federal Army preferred, and not because that's all they could do, unlike the Confederates, they had to have a 50-50 blend of rifle versus smoothbore. The Union armies preferred a blend of one to two smoothbore or rifled artillery. I mean, having a longer range is fine, but you have to be able to see your enemy uh, to aim at him, and in the size of Civil War battlefields, often the range of the rifled piece was unnecessary, which also applies to the uh, shoulder muskets as well. Another thing is, you, you would think that the exploding shells and, and all that we're going to discuss would be far more lethal to uh, massed infantry formations, never underestimate the power of the, the round, solid cannon ball fired by the smooth bore. The rifle pieces fired elongated projectiles. And when they hit the ground, no matter what they were, uh, if they didn't explode, they buried themselves. That smooth bore Napoleon, which fired a round cannon ball, when it hit, it went bounding along. And if you have a massed formation of infantrymen, a bounding cannonball could be devastating. Well, another difference in federal and confederate. Federal batteries had the same kinds of guns in each battery. We, we talked about three different kinds of cannon. Each battery would be one or the other of those three. Confederates, they had mixed batteries. They didn't like to have them that way, but they did. 
which meant that they had to also keep mixed kinds of ammunition available for each one of their batteries. This is one of those useless facts that I always wondered about till I worked the figures. You go to Gettysburg and you see all those cannon on a, on, at Gettysburg and you wonder, well, I wonder how many cannon were here the day of the battle. Well, it turns out there are 61% artillery pieces there today compared to what was there the day of the battle. Which means there was a lot of cannon there on the day of the battle. Okay, the, with the introduction of rifled muskets and rifled artillery, the Civil War was the first war. If you could be seen, you could be killed. Something to think about. Now, in the, in the uh, Wilderness Campaign of 1864, a famous example of this is that of uh, Major General Uncle John Sedgwick at the Battle of Spotsylvania when he was sitting on his horse when certain members of his staff around were dodging some bullets being fired by a Confederate sharpshooter a thousand yards away, and Uncle John Sedgwick chastised them for dodging out of the way, saying, I couldn't hit an elephant at this distance, and he immediately was struck in the head and killed instantly. He, he has been rendered immortal by showing up in all the books of famous last words. <laughs> but an example of artillery was at, uh, at uh, Pine Mountain, Georgia, in June 14, 1864, when full Confederate General uh, Joe Johnston was having a chat with uh, Lieutenant Generals Leonidas Polk and William Hardy. And a federal artillerist, I don't know how far away, but he saw what looked to him like a group of senior Confederate officers talking among themselves. So he put a round in that came very close. Whereupon Generals Hardy and, and uh, Johnston hauled ass for cover quickly. But General Polk, for reasons known only to himself and only briefly, took his time and the very next artillery shell, in the words of Eliza Doolittle in the musical My Fair Lady, it's what done her in, done him in. Now, in the interest of historical accuracy, it didn't decapitate him. It hit him in the chest, but the end result was the same. And in that brief moment, that federal artillerist performed a tremendous service to the Confederacy, because if General Polk was not the most incompetent Confederate general, he was certainly the most incompetent senior Confederate general. Well, when we get to discussing the range of artillery pieces, uh, on the lid of the limbers, the ammunition cages, chests on limbers and caissons. They had range tables, and of course the range varies about what type of shot you're firing and how much powder you're using and the elevation of the gun. And if your eyes aren't glazing over now, they will. Uh, and here is, uh, you get this off the internet, and uh, the pounds there on the left are the pounds of powder. Well, n note the red part. Now for reasons that I can't explain, I don't think anybody else too, when they first developed in 1860, the, uh, the uh, three-inch ordnance rifle, we already had the 10-pounder Parrot. One had a bore of three inches and one had a bore of 2.9 inches. Duh. That means you could fire the, the, the projectiles for one in the other, but not in the other in the one. You got it? Okay. By 1863, it dawned on the Federal artillerists Maybe if we made them both three inches, it would simplify things. So they did. So if you see range tables that give different ranges for the two guns, they're probably earlier in the war when they had a different diameter. Okay. Now, the thousand yards, that won't show up on any particular table. It's significant. But I put it there because they have what they call live fire artillery competitions throughout the United States every year. 
I mean, three or four places. And for three times, I have gone up to Camp Grayling in, in the Lower Peninsula, up the very north of the Lower Peninsula, and, and attended one of these live fire competitions in which they fire either modern reproductions or they fire actual Civil War artillery pieces. And they fire Civil War powder charges. And the rifle pieces fire a solid shot, which is a bolt, we'll discuss that in a minute, fire a follow shot. And they're firing at a four by eight sheet of plywood at a thousand yards. And the good ones hit it more times than they miss. So if you're wanting to know about distances, if you had your rifle Civil War artillery piece sitting at the sample gates there, uh, where Kirkwood ends and the university starts, and you're aiming west at a four by eight sheet of plywood on Madison Street, you're gonna hit it more times than not. And it is well within the effective range that the tables give you if you're firing at Rose Hill Cemetery. So you couldn't have a camp of infantrymen, whatever, they build their tents and up their fires and whatnot. On Rose Hill Cemetery, if there's artillery within the range there of the sample gates, it would be devastating. Okay. Now, one thing about Civil War artillery, remember, you can't have all those buildings between where you're firing the cannon and your target. You have to be able to see your target. No indirect fire. Okay. Well, this is an artillery range chart, and I put that in. This is showing the three-inch ordnance rifle and the parrot having slightly different ranges. But you look at the maximum range, the distance to the American Legion post, those cannon that are sitting at the sample gates at Kirkwood firing at us here, we are within their maximum range. And the red line down at the bottom shows in the famous artillery duel on the third day at Gettysburg from Cemetery Hill to Seminary Hill, well within the accurate range of the artillery pieces. Now, if you're gonna be so accurate with, an, with any aimed artillery piece, you gotta have sights and good sights. And you're looking at a at the, uh, the cannon on the battlefield, you know, where the hell are the sights? Lots of times the knife sight on the barrel out on the very end of the muzzle has been knocked off or bent, what another. Well, the sight on the breech, the more important one, you'll never see outside of a museum. There were more than one sights types, but the most popular one in the Civil War was called the pendulum hawse. And it was on two axes with a lead weight at the bottom. And you put it on these two little prongs here at the, mus at the breech end of the gun. They're indicated on the right. And the pendulum halls could swing in two different directions, in two different axes, so that just like the binnacle of a compass, it was always level no matter what rough ground the cannon was on. Does everybody understand that? Okay, so here we are. We've got our pendulum hall sight set up on our cannon. He's sighting the piece. Made the adjustments in the position of the cannon. We're all ready to fire. And then that pendulum hall is, is removed from the cannon so that the recoil doesn't throw it off and damage it. And here are some other examples of sights but the pendulum halls remain the most popular. Now, it's not a big deal, but a battery was organized with a captain in charge, and those six pieces were broken down to sections of two guns each. There would be a lieutenant in charge of each section. But one of the things about artillery, especially in the Union Army, was that uh, career advancement was zilch among the officer corps. And the officers, there were, there were no ninnies, they know that. Uh, one of my favorite generals, uh, General John Gibbon, who wrote one of the artillerist manuals. This guy was an artillerist uh, through his every fiber of his being. But he saw right off, you're not going to go anywhere in the Army as an artillerist. So he, he quit the artillery and got into the infantry, wound up to be a major general. It was one of the corps commanders in the Army of the, uh, the Potomac. Sidelight there. 
Okay, we're going to talk about projectiles. And each projectile had a powder bag with a vent, an opening that connected the powder uh, bag to the outside so you could take your priming wire or the vent pick, run it down that hole, poke a hole in the powder, and then stick a friction primer down through that vertical hole, pull the cord, and you fired your, your piece. And the friction uh, primer, you see the iron for the lanyard up there, it works like a match. The friction of you pulling through the top to the left lit a spark that, that lit off the powder in that vertical copper body, and that's what fired your gun. Now, it's just not one kind of black powder. Powder comes at all different grain sizes, and the larger the, the cannon, this, the larger the grain size because it burns slower. If you're firing a pistol or a musket, you want a very fine grit powder that burns quickly. If you're firing artillery, you want it to burn slower. I point this out so that if you have an old artillery uh, cannon in your basement and you want to take it out to the farmer's field, and you went down and you, you bought a couple of pounds of black powder for use in a musket uh -huh. and put it in your cannon, that might be the last thing you or your cannon ever did. <laughs> now, if you learn nothing else today, you'll learn Stuckey's Law. You really feel powerful when you can create a law. Whenever there are many ways of doing the same task, it means one of two things. Either all of those ways are reasonably satisfactory, or none of those ways are getting the job done very well. And that's why they keep coming up with new ways to accomplish what's not being done very well to begin with. The second of those applies to artillery. Now there are four types of Civil War field artillery projectiles and all three of the cannon we've discussed fire all four of these. If they have a solid shot and in a smooth bore Napoleon that's called a cannon ball. In a rifle piece it's an extended projectile not a ball, it's extended, and it's called a bolt. So, the other three types have the same name, regardless of the cannon that's shooting them. Although, remember, they're all going to be round for a smoothbore, and they're all going to be elongated for a rifle piece. Okay. And here we have a cannonball uh, attached to its sabot, attached to its powder bag. A sabot meant two different things. One, it was a way of attaching the cannonball or projectile to the powder bag. But well, it had another meaning that we'll get to a little later. Now, the shell was one of the types. It was hollow and it was filled with gunpowder. And the reason why they, you see those metal straps that attached the cannonball to the sabot to the powder bag was when that went off in the cannon barrel, you wanted the fuse to be pointed out so the flame would go around and ignite the fuse and everything would work. If the fuse willy-nilly was in any position in the barrel, including pointing backwards, there was a very good chance that it would be damaged in the firing and not work. So you want the fuse pointed out. Now, a shell would generally have a timed fuse in it so that it would go off in the air above the enemy and break up into pieces of shrapnel. Unfortunately, black powder is not strong enough to accomplish this efficiently. You would like that to go off such that there were literally hundreds of little pieces of shrapnel going off everywhere, but actually, Seven or eight or 10 or 12 was the most they could get out of, a, of an exploding outer casing because the black powder just wasn't strong enough. The deficiency of fuses we'll get to later. Shells were lightweight since they were hollow and contained only gunpowder. And the uneven wall thickness resulted in poor accuracy because the center of gravity of the shell was not always the geometric center of the projectile. And although gunpowder wasn't strong enough to break them into enough pieces, they were deadly when going off on the ground. 
unlike case shot, which we'll get to. So if one of these, if the fuse hasn't gone off exactly right, so it's just laying there as opposed to being up in the air, and it goes off, if you're standing around it, you're in trouble. Well, case shot was invented by Colonel Henry Shrapnel. Got that? Now you know where that name comes from. Where Henry Shrapnel invented that roughly in 1787, and it's thinner walls, and it's filled with cannon, little little uh, uh, cannon, uh, balls, lead balls, and with a fuse. And when it goes off, these little balls go everywhere. Now the black powder charge inside it is not meant to blow those little pellets, those little balls off. It's only meant to break the outer shell because the momentum of that projectile going through the air is enough to give dispersion to the balls inside it. Which means that if one of these is laying on the ground and it goes off, those balls aren't really bothering anybody. If, if it gets you, it gets you because the outer shell of the case is uh, is hurting you just like case shot would. So case shot has thinner walls than shell, but because it's filled with 72 balls, it was heavier, it could substitute for solid shot. Which meant if you ran out of fuses, don't worry about it, just fire it and have it work like, like uh, solid shot. And then we get to canister. The most lethal at close range Canister was deadly. And here you see the innards, which is these lead balls about the size of a walnut for a Napoleon smoothbore, inside a very thin tin can arrangement. And on the right here, we have in my collection a reproduction of that projectile, the powder bag, and the window there, which is just to allow you to see the lead balls inside. That wouldn't be there in a real, real piece. The minute that leaves the barrel, that tin can is so flimsy, it just disintegrates, and those balls go shooting out like a shotgun. And the range of canister was about four to 600 yards, but you would keep firing canister the closer, the closer, the closer the enemy got to, you would be firing canister at a point blank range uh, before the infantryman got to you and killed your artilleryman. Uh, and when you were in extremis, you could fire double and triple uh, loaded canister. And when they ran out of canister, they'd fire rotten shot, which they would remove the fuse from a spherical case shot and fire it from the smoothbore Napoleons. The shell would explode at the muzzle, and the effect would be sinister, uh, similar to canister. So remember, they're firing a case shot, which is full of all the little lead balls, mm -hmm. taking the fuse off. Now, you will hear a grape shot talked about in the literature. Grape shot was a naval weapon, not an army weapon. When the Confederacy stole a bunch of uh, federal equipment and, and uh, uh, ammunition and one thing, when they left the Union, they got a lot of, of grape shot that they used up in, uh, in army battles, but as soon as they were gone, they weren't reproducing them. Now, everything I've said here applies both to the smoothbore and the, and the rifle, the projectiles. It's just a question of the shape of the projectile. So we've got case and shell for a rifle piece, and their canister was not as effective as the smoothbore because it wasn't as big a diameter. Would you rather be firing 14 pounds of lead balls at the enemy or 8 pounds? Well, you'd rather be firing 14 pounds. And when you fired canister from a rifled piece, the rifling, when it left the barrel, the rifling tended to disperse those walnut shape, or it wouldn't be a walnut shape in a, in a rifle piece, tended to disperse them. And you didn't want them all that dispersed. They're going to disperse just the right amount for you uh, without that. So. And also, the canister fired from a rifle piece had only about a half the range of a smoothbore. So let's go back. Remember how 
you didn't want to replace all your smooth bores with these modern rifle pieces because they were fired more accurate and longer range. No, those Napoleon smooth bores came in handy, especially when the enemy is is coming down hard on you, firing double-loaded and sometimes triple-loaded canister, which you put one powder bag and three, two or three canister projectiles in. You're really an extreme. By the time you're doing that, you're also not swabbing the barrel out with the water sponge. You also have nicotine stains in your skivvies about that time. <laughs> well, how do you get the artillery projectiles to take the rifley, which we call lands in grooves, in the barrel of a Civil War rifle piece, such as a 10-pound parrot or three-inch ordnance rifle? <laughs> you remember, if those aren't doing any good if your projectile isn't <clears throat> grabbing a hold of those, of those lands in grooves and spinning. Well, Stuckey's law applies because none of the systems worked very well, and there were nine different systems to accomplish that. Somewhere even had uh, subsections of those systems. For example, and we're just going to show you some examples. Remember, none of these really worked great. They haven't figured out a, an efficient system yet. The Hodgkiss had the, the uh, uh, metal butt there that when the, when the explosion came to fire your cannon, that pushed that piece up and expanded that lead band sabot, the other name for the sabot, the part of the projectile that grabbed the grooves and lands, pushed that up, expanded the lid, that grabbed the lands and grooves and out the projectile went. Uh, the reed parrot had uh, one kind of a metal or another and a concave thing on the end, but that expanded to take the lands and grooves. The Schenkel had paper mache, and you see the paper mache indicated on the left. The right one didn't, doesn't have the paper mache on it. The Confederacy could never make paper mache that worked. Now the Federals, they knew how to make paper mache, by God. Now, you would think, and the artillerists did too, wow, if we come up with a really neat system that allows the projectile to grab the lands and grooves, that's also going to block all the flame from going around the projectile to ignite the fuse. So, in some cases, they devised longitudinal uh, uh, grooves in their projectile that would allow some flame. Well, it turns out they were, they were worried for nothing because none of the systems of grabbing the lands and grooves worked efficiently enough to prevent the flame from going up past to light the fuse. Another uh, system, and here we have a system of the archers, and you see the, the different ways they tried for the lid to be on there. So, a quick review. The Napoleon fired a solid shot called a cannonball and case, shell, and canister, the case and shell being balls. The three-inch orders rifle, the 10-pound parrot fired solid shot, which was called a bolt, and case and shell, which were elongated projectiles, and canister. Now, artillery fuses. And the most important thing for you to learn here today is artillery fuses are spelled with a Z, and your household fuse is spelled with an S. And that is not an artillery fuse. That is an artillery fuse. It is a Borman fuse. There were four types of artillery fuses. One was timed, so the explosion goes off so many seconds after it's left the barrel. One is a percussion, so it will go off when it hits something straight on. A combination with time and percussion. And a concussion where the explosion will occur when striking the target at any angle, not just head on. A fuse wrench would screw the fuse down into the projectile, and then you would use a fuse wrench to set the fuse. And there were all different kinds of fuses. There were dozens of different kinds of fuses. Stuckey's Law, none of them worked all that well. So in 
So we're going to discuss one fuse. Thank God, they said. One fuse, the Borman fuse, the most popular fuse and the most effective fuse. And the way it worked is you had a horizontal circle, almost complete circle of black powder in your fuse. One end of which was, had a powder train to the central core that went down into the projectile. And then on the top of the fuse was a thin layer of metal that was graded one through five to indicate seconds. So the artilleryman took that punch and he punched a hole in the number of seconds he wanted the, the fuse to last. So when the gun went off and the explosion occurred, the flame came around the projectile, it would ignite that circle of powder which would start burning around. But one end, it, when it got to the end, it was a dead end and that didn't matter. But the other end when it burned around, it got to the powder train to the central core. So if over here at one second, you see there, if the hole is right there, that sucker's gonna go off quickly. If you poke over here by five, it's going to go off in five seconds that it takes to burn around there. Well, that seems pretty simple. And that's why it was one of the most popular fuses. However, oh, there's a Borman fuse, a real one, in a real cannonball. In December 24th, 1862, Confederate Ordnance Bureau Circular ordered manufacture of Borman fuses to be discontinued. They were simply unable to reliably manufacture them. They used predominantly paper fuses. A paper fuse was a paper fill with powder put down in a wood, that put down in the end of the barrel, and they would adjust the time in flight by cutting uh, off the wood. So, the final summary. Civil War artillery was a bad offensive weapon, but an excellent defensive one. We don't have time to discuss that. Black powder did not provide enough explosive force to achieve the best results with exploding projectiles. No consistent, reliable method of forcing the projectiles to take the rifling had been developed. No reliable fuses had been developed for projectiles. No reliable method for breech loading had been developed for artillery pieces. No recoil system had as yet been developed. And it is estimated that two thirds of Confederate field artillery was captured from federal forces. Civil War artillery caused about 10% of casualties as opposed to World War II and Korea, where artillery, including mortars, caused 75% of casualties. And in World War I, the artillery had caused 67% of ca casualties. And in the Civil War, there was no way for direct fire using spotters. To hit a target, you had to see it and engage in direct fire. And that is it. And for those of you who want a recommended further reading, the one on the right is a, is a 60 or 70 page introduction, as it says. The one on the left is an extraordinarily detailed, uh, tells you everything you ever wanted to know and more. So those are the alpha and omega of artillery. And I thank you all for being very patient. Now, I'd be happy to ask if there are any questions. If you want to play Stump the Speaker. I had a question. Yeah, George. You said, you said that uh, one of the earlier pictures, you had two batteries set up, one close in and one of them further back. Was that staged for effect, or did they ever set their batteries up like that? Where I, 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 don't rec I don't recall that being on a slide that I've indicated that, yeah. but, but no. No, the batteries were tended to be uh, the, the guns were in one line. And the only thing that, that, that depended, I forget the number of yards between between individual cannon, but a lot of times they were a lot closer than what the textbook called for. But they weren't for any reason done that way. Yeah. Did they ever use any indirect fire in the Civil War with the No. His question was, did they ever use indirect fire? No. 
the artillerist behind the gun, he aimed it at what he saw. There was never an example of firing at something over the hill. Oh, I hate to use that expression in people our age, but uh, they, uh, uh, there needs to be another expression. Anyway, the only time they would fire beyond the horizon where they could not see is just harassment. We know that uh, a target's over there, a town, a large group or something, and we know we get the distance figured out, so we'll just lob browns over there. But no, nobody could spot for a Civil War artillery piece. Oh, yes. Your case and shell both. Remember your, your fuses, he had a time fuse and a combination time fuse. And they were meant to go off as an airburst for both the case sh shot and the shell. Now, a lot of times they didn't, and that's why I talked about the difference when they would go off while laying on the ground, because it didn't work, the, the time part didn't work or it did work and the, and the percussion didn't work. Uh, but yeah, they were supposed to go off in the air. Chain shot was not, it was used rarely, rarely in the Navy. Uh, and, and generally that was something Confederates tended to try because they were desperate, they try anything. But no, not to my knowledge. You talk about chain shot uh, and there's different, the idea of having a cannonball and a cannonball and they're connected with chain and they put it down uh, two cannons alongside of one another, that idea didn't work. It never worked and they never tried it because you can't get two cannons going off at the same time. And you can imagine what one goes off a little bit before the other and a cannonball. <laughs> Bad news. Now they did experiment with it, but that, that idea isn't going to work. But they did occasionally take two cannonballs attached with a chain, put them both down the same cannon and fire them. But when that was done, it would tend to be done in the Navy because that one then would really be devastating to the, to the rigging on the enemy ship. Tracy. Yeah, what was the main difference between several between 10% casualties he, he want to know why 10% casualties in the artillery in the Civil War, yet 67% in World War I, 75%. That was because, of, number one, the improvement in the explosive force. I mean, cannon, when they replaced uh, uh, black powder in the 1880s with the smokeless powder and later cordite and all kinds of really powerful explosives, you can do much uh, more devastation with an artillery round, number one. Number two, indirect fire uh, got so good th that you could then fire for miles away and come pretty darn close without being able to see what you're firing at, but you can still come pretty darn close. And of course, indirect fire with spotters was developed, all of which made it more efficient at killing infantrymen. Somebody back here. Yes, sir. So did weather play in use weather. of in, in what? <coughs> well, I mean, it seemed like to me if it's raining, oh. you're not going to be able to fire off those cannons because the powder is going to get soaked or the fuse. Uh, it didn't affect it that much, no. Remember, the powder's in a bag, and the guy who, when he's doing it by the book, he is carrying a leather pouch. And, of course, it's pouring down rain. The lid of the... Of the ammunition chest won't be left open. He is going to raise the lift, pull out the projector, put it in his pouch with the flap over it, and go up to the, to, uh, to the cannon, hand it to somebody, and they very quickly are going to put it in the barrel. Now, you say, well, why in the hell did he have to put it in a pouch? Why couldn't he just carry it up there? Because, well, first of all, if it's raining, but second of all, when you're out in the field, assuming that you've got the time to do things by the book, you want that powder bag that could explode at any moment, should any incoming... Remember that the enemy is trying to kill you while you're doing all this. And if they have an artillery round coming in with case or shrapnel or something going on, you want that powder bag exposed as little as possible to some uh, uh, flame of any kind, no matter how small. 
So I don't think the weather would affect, if it was a deluge, that would be a little different, but. Any other questions? Sir? I know on the third day of the Battle of Gettysburg, between the two forces, the South artillery badly overshot the North. Yes. Remind me why that was. That's an interesting question because I'm going to answer you in a way I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the, part, the part that I know what I'm talking about is Confederate artillery was just never very good, period. And it would be, they were so incompetent in a way that the, the godlike Robert E. Lee, his chief of artillery was a man named Pendleton, who everybody in the entire Confederate army knew was one of the most nicest men and the most incompetent officer around. And Lee put up with him the whole time. Nobody can understand why that is, because Lee knew he was incompetent. He was so incompetent that when the Confederates started running out of ammunition and they needed to resupply because they had the ammunition available, nobody could find it because Pendleton couldn't remember where it was. <laughs> now, the, the overshooting, it would be simple for me to say, and up to now I know what I'm talking about, that, the, that they were just not as good. But I read an article one time, and I'm not sure where, where it is. I would love to find a copy of it. But as I recall the article, it said that the conf Confederates knew that their fuses were so bad, they had learned to compensate fairly well with their distances. And all of a sudden, they had been supplied with a batch of well-constructed fuses that actually were, compared to what they had before, were quite accurate. So they were compensating when they didn't need to, and the compensation made them overshoot. Now, whether that's true or not, it was in an article. It's been years since I read it. But does that answer your, your question yeah. as best I can? Any more questions? Thank you all.